Let's get close but not so close for a time. We can share from a distance for a time. We want to see each other. We'll have to stay in your golden time space while we talk. Let's go. 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 let us go as uh, kind of all of us in the world have gone through this strict quarantining, and now we're sitting here with all of these questions of how do we op reopen and how will things be different? Hi, I'm Peter Hirschberg, and welcome to Quarantine. Uh, if you've been following us, you know that our early shows were looking at the middle of how do we social distance and how are our media changing to adapt to us uh, in the middle of this very different form of existence. And this week's shows are really looking at what happens next. Uh, Friday's show is going to be about the future of cities, downtowns, and transportation, and, 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 and how, how does that look differently. And today we're focused on California, China, and the global supply chain. Um, obviously, international relations and globalization have been at the center of all of this. And fundamental questions about does manufacturing become more local? Uh, do we need more, does more resilient manufacturing mean more localness? And also at the center of this, kind of the very interesting differences between U.S. national manufacturing policy and, say, California's own policy, because we are such a portal to the Pacific. So on today's show, we have with us uh, three people who will really help us dig into this. Uh, Darlene Chu Bryant leads uh, Global SF. It is San Francisco's International Economic Development Organization, which includes uh, China SF, Asia SF, Latin SF, and, and really building relationships between our startups and the Asian and international communities. Uh, and fundamental questions have come up about nationalism and about, uh, does for national security purposes, does the semiconductor community back onshore here? Uh, and, and sitting in the middle of this, all of the startups that, that are here and, and our Asian partners. So Darlene will help us uh, examine that. And I should also point out, I'm on the board of Global SF. Also joining us today is Nadia Hewitt from the World Economic Forum. And there's probably no greater uh, group that represents uh, global leaders in, in manufacturing and corporations. And the effort that Nadia has been leading has really been the blockchain and digital currencies effort. But it turns out that uh, blockchain becomes essential to better supply chains. And on today's show, we're really gonna dig into the fact that if you need a more resilient supply chain, that is, if the world is changing so quickly, it isn't like it was last week or last month, how do you adapt faster? And that requires far more actually collaboration, open information, secure open information, which becomes a matter of technically designing resilience into what you're building. And our third guest today is, uh, is our is our good friend uh, Hans Galland, who leads Holistics, which focuses on logistics in the U.S., which is also, in, in the case of his company, they focus on trucking, something that has not been really redesigned, but requires much more resilient information technology. So this show is really about how do we build for what's next, this sense of resilience that has to be built into the architectural level and our mentalities becomes important for what we're building next, and that comes up right against technical issues and also issues of what does global cooperation look like as we go into uh, what we might call the real 21st century or the post-COVID world. Joining me is my co-host, Mickey McManus. Hello, Mickey. Hey, Peter. How you doing? Hi. Um, well, okay. So today's show really begins a series on what gets built next. And, you know, one of the themes that we've had is that underlying all of this is kind of systems theory or complexity. That is when so many things change all at once uh, and there's less certainty, the way we build things and think about the world actually has to be different. We've known this for years, but in many ways, the future arrived next week as opposed to further out in the future. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. I mean, we're gonna hear from three different points of view on this. I think it's interesting to think about like, what would nature do? You know, I, I will often go back to nature and say, you know, it's been running an interesting experiment called life for 
three billion years. Um, and it's it's a pretty complex global information system. So what, what would nature do in this? Um, and nature like abhors a singleton. Nature doesn't like a single point of failure at all because it's the end of a species. And I think what we're starting to see is the just in time nature of so many of our supply chains has implied that we have these single points of failure that can actually take down large spaces. And so I, I think a part of what we'd like to hear about is is just sort of what uh, what is this uh, era suddenly signaling to us about our ability to be resilient, about our ability to to deal with uncertainty, and and have we sort of just squeaked out every bit of efficiency for things as long as the world doesn't change? But you know, nature. Um, is tough and and we haven't seen the last of, of sort of a biological century this is just the beginning of it and so what what will happen is is a big open question um the other thing is uh, we do have a uh, a whiteboard that's just sort of an infinite whiteboard that we've been looking at here's today's episode um but if you were to pull back you'd actually see all the episodes together and you'd be able to see that we're, we're kind of just doing experiments with different formats of ways of doing things in this case um, can we start to even look for patterns across different episodes? Uh, so this is open. Anybody can draw on it. I just would ask you, you can find the link on our archive side at quarantine.today. Um, but uh, uh, try to be nice. You know, if you're going to use an, a marker, try not to do the graffiti stuff. Uh, but if there's something you're hearing that you really want to draw a picture of or write something down, uh, feel free to jump on. Um, it's all an experiment. So we'll see how that goes. Let's, uh, let's start with uh, Darlene. Hello, Darlene. Welcome. Hi. Good afternoon. How are you two doing? It's amazing, uh, and hey, I'm Darlene. so excited to be invited back on the show again. That's right. We Thanks, we Darlene. in one of our very first shows, uh, Global SF, which of course has an international trade focus, but also focuses on how our local companies interact. Suddenly, you found yourself in the middle of all of this small business PPP, helping these companies not with their trade with Asia, but just surviving. Right. Uh, so talking about resiliency, right? Yeah. When an organization like us has been focused on just attracting and uh, you know bringing in foreign direct investment, all of a sudden we have to pivot and be resilient and say, you know what? Let's focus on helping our businesses here now survive and make sure that they can uh, you know, continue to thrive through this tough and uh, unprecedented COVID period, right? So uh, I think that San Francisco is known for being resilient. I think that uh, traditionally, historically, we've been a city of entrepreneurs. Uh, resiliency is probably our middle name, if not our bigger name, um, and it just describes us. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, when we talk about um, the supply chain, for example, where, um, you know, what is going on? And, you know, when you talk about what's, you know, what is our relationship with China and the rest of the world? Well, what I'll say is, first of all, uh, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. And uh, it makes us one of the biggest trading partners for China. And then for San Francisco, what does that mean? Um, that we have been reliant on China because we're used to getting our goods manufactured very cheaply, right? We're used to going to China when we want to get someone to make something for us, for example. Uh, but the thing is that when you think about, for example, in, since 2016 and actually in 2018, um, after this current administration started, uh, when you know um, we started imposing a series of tariffs on Chinese-made goods and not and and not and and more so than from other nations, um, we had to rethink: Are we going to continue buying everything from China, or do we look at other uh, you know areas to source? And what can we now source locally? What can be manufactured locally? And what can we, we move back? Whether it be you know. Um, clothing, whether it be, you know, even our, our equipment, like our computers, um, our phones, what can we bring back to be manufactured on the state side? So there's a lot of thought, a lot of, um, I would say, entrepreneurialism, right, um, that has been going on now um, in the U.S. side and in San Francisco and the greater Bay Area just to address those problems. What has conversation been like in the last month or so? Because as we headed into this, you know, delegations would come over, they would work with our companies on innovation, uh, semiconductor companies would go back and forth. 
Um, what have the conversations been like as suddenly all of this in-person stuff stopped? Are people continue to have innovation conversations or is this all like emergency kind of stuff? You know, the fact that this government, our government's blaming China for stuff, has that come up? What are they? You know? Yeah, that, that definitely has come up. And then for me, I mean, I've been working in the world with China for so many years already. That comes up always. But I always say Chinese are very entrepreneurial and they'll find a way to get things done. That being said, you know, we've been looking at ways where, hey, does it make sense for you as a factory in China to actually have a presence in the U.S.? Let's start from the assembly perspective. What what equipment or what parts are, are, you, are you already sourcing overseas that we can just have it shipped to the San Francisco Bay Area and manufactured here? I will say that, you know, when we first started the shelter in place, everything was about, you know, we were trying, to, we were talking about survival, but now that that's kind of eased up a little bit and we're now thinking about, okay, we have to think about making a living now, you know, what's going on. Everybody is now looking at, hey, post COVID, what are we going to do next to make sure that our supply chain is no longer impacted? And we're definitely looking at that now. I was looking at some statistics the other day. It was real estate investors saying where they wanted to put their money next. And yeah. at the top of the list was uh, space for manufacturing. So yeah. light industrial, like the sense that more investment in being able to manufacture things here. Uh, down on the bottom of the list was like downtown office space. So uh -huh. are you are you seeing... I mean, literally, are you seeing a greater interest in uh, investing in manufacturing, and in particular in the high tech world, you know, where where semiconductors take the highest investment and have national security implications? Yeah. So starting even with the semiconductor business, and I will share that even before COVID, uh, we had started talking to the biggest manufacturers that had moved to Taiwan. And we had been talking about what would it look like to start moving some of that manufacturing to San Francisco, or not even San Francisco, but to the US. So that work has actually been ongoing now for a year, if not more. Um, and so from there, you can already, and, and even San Francisco itself, knowing that, you know, we've had a tech boom. We started with a tech bomb, like, you know, back in uh, 2000. But the thing is that the last uh, uh, eight to nine years, right, we've been really growing and significantly in the last five years, we've been significantly growing our tech economy in San Francisco. I will say and give San Francisco credit that they've been saying, you know what, we can't focus our economic development on just tech. What else are we doing? And as a result, San Francisco has also been investing in, you know, what does PDR look like? What does, you know, production distribution and retail outlets look like if we start expanding that space and development in San Francisco, right? So San Francisco has already started looking in diverse diversifying its own economy. And that work has been starting now for two years already. So I think that San Francisco is, has started positioning it. And moving forward, we are well positioned to move into light manufacturing, uh, and definitely not, you know, uh, heavy manufacturing that would be for other areas because San Francisco is too small. And the Bay Area, I don't think we're well equipped for that. But we're definitely moving in a direction where light manufacturing, we welcome it, we're getting prepared for it. And I dare say that a lot of even foreign investors who have been investing in uh, residential, they are also starting to look at what does, you know, light manufacturing space, what do those areas look like? And how much do I have to put into that? So I have definitely started seeing the trend. As a matter of fact, uh, earlier today, we had another webinar on real estate, and uh, it was not really so much about office space. It was more like, uh, what can we do to, you know, change and be resilient and change and um, re and re repurpose um, the office space or the office buildings that we already have into something else? Is that something else, residential or manufacturing? Manufacturing, not residential. Yeah. Finally, this is this is an amazing back to the future moment, right? We've just right. spent 15 years of taking every shipyard and turning them into mixed use developments and making it too expensive to go make stuff. So you had to go to Oakland or Reno. And then all of a sudden one afternoon we wake up and it's like, just kidding. We're going to have to like make stuff here. I mean, right. this is, it has been Although, so expensive and difficult. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, no, I do. And, and maybe a, a question for Darlene. I mean, what are you seeing or are you seeing anything happen? happening in, in what they call reconfigurable micro factories. So I know Nick Pinkston here in San Francisco has something called Plethora, which is like low volume machining and he's sort of doing it all via software. So it's kind of straight from CAM and CAD right to machining and, and limited run. And a lot of people are talking about 3D printing and you know additive manufacturing now, but it seems like the big, the big excitement around that was a little bit of a hype cycle. 
um, you know, with consumer stuff. But the big excitement seems to be how can you we reconfigure and do limited run or short run and use materials from you know a hundred kilometer radius and actually just actually have a much more circular economy. What are you seeing in that regard? Like signals about light manufacturing. I noticed uh, you know bright machines down the down the street on uh, on, on um, it's either fourth or it's it's on one of those streets uh, is is part of Flex and Flextronics, and it's an initiative to do sort of robotic microassembly of of circuit boards and of of testing. Um, and so it seems like there are some interesting startups in the region around this hyper local reconfigurable micro factories. What are you seeing in that regard? Absolutely. I mean, we started seeing that. I mean, of course, as of May started a lot, oh, quite a, quite a few years ago. Yeah. Around the same time, China SF started, and we started look, you know, focusing on a local manufacturing economy, right? Small, uh, uh, um, but uh, or I don't want to call it cottage stuff, but then at least smaller uh, scale. But the thing is that what I've seen in the last two to three years is that there is starting to be a move and a serious look at advanced manufacturing, um, you know, kind of similar to what you're talking about, but there are, work, there are uh, you know, to your point, uh, uh, areas in uh, the dog patch, right? South of market, where they do have these tiny factories, they do have, um, you know, uh, 3D printers, uh, where they can do small batch runs of products that they can manufacture for clients. Um, and and again, to your point, just may, and and even um, uh, I'm seeing schools, for example, um, Laney College, right, where they're actually training um, people uh, to use these machines and 3D printers so that they can start as, and set up small manufacturers like that. So there definitely is a trend to start doing that here in the Bay Area, if not just in San Francisco. We have to, there there is that trend for sure. Well, it feels like too. Um, you know, one of the things I've seen, you know, when I was at Autodesk as a fellow there, we had Pier Nine, and it was sort of like a, it was sort of like a test bed for right. for new kinds of manufacturing, from synthetic biology to robotic stuff. <clears throat> and and I think what what we're seeing is, you know, a typical factory that we might find in China, for example, if you want to make a, a car or if you want to make a serious, you know, a million of something or half a million of something. You have to configure the factory. It might take you months and months to configure the factory. Um, and then if you're gonna build like, let's say a car, you've gotta make all the radiators and all the other pieces for that car now, because it's real, so hard to like, you can't reconfigure those pieces in 10 years to get parts, spare parts. Right. And something like 70% of the spare parts and warehouses for automobiles are never used. It's a lot of sunk cost. It's a lot of warehouses on the other side of the planet that you know, we, we don't necessarily need. And these days what we're seeing is a lot more of shifting to software, it's in the cloud, the files there, and then just sort of print on demand. What's, what's the conversation like when you're talking to both people in China and people in, the, in, in San Francisco region about this sort of shift to put more in the cloud, even for manufacturing? Or are you seeing that yet? I, I am actually seeing that. I would say it's less in China, but more in Taiwan, uh, because mm -hmm. what I realize is that, um, for example, Tesla, uh, more than 40% of their parts are actually imported, right, from, from places ah. like Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, they are looking at, hey, instead of manufacturing so many pieces that, to your point, sit in the warehouse, what can I do on demand? And so they are, I am seeing factories from Taiwan actually saying, we have to move stateside so we'll be closer to the to the client, right? Mm. And to, um, so that we can provide them uh, what they need on demand versus waiting, you know, producing it in Taiwan and shipping it over to the US. Mm. Because by the time you get to the factory, who knows what what will have happened by then. So we are definitely seeing mm. a trend again, moving uh, manufacturing back to the state side, be closer to the end user so that we can get it to the consumer a lot faster. Mm. That is definitely a trend that we're seeing now. And I think, and I don't think it's just uh, on the US and the state side. We also see that in China. Everything is on demand now. It's like, I don't want to wait a month for it. I want it like now. So you have all these mm -hmm. courier service, for example, that are popping up. And I'm sure that, you know, that's going to be a conversation that Hans is going to be able to address later mm -hmm. on today. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is, um, you know, this is one of those things that could be a significant paradigm shift here, right? So we're aware of the fact that for national security purposes, uh, you don't want to be reliant on something having to come over there if somebody's factory sh uh, shuts down. Um, you know, we're aware of the, uh, certainly the nationalistic moment we have says we want more one manufacturing, more manufacturing here. And we understand there's this relationship between uh, resilience and also taking care of your workforce. But 
to show you how this is, if either counterintuitive or difficult, uh, about three years ago, I wrote a book with, with Dale Doherty and Marcia Cavanaugh called The Maker City. And this looked at this whole question of the rise of um, making and manufacturing in cities largely as kind of a reaction to the always, to the just software or software will eat the world phenomenon. But one of the things you found if you talk to people like SF Made or the Brooklyn Navy Yard is this stuff is tough and expensive. And I don't think we saw the rise of, of local manufacturing as much as we expected because manufacturing so respected scale and supply chains were so optimized, manufacturing was so optimized for lower costs. Uh, it would be interesting to see if this changes. And a lot of this is also wrapped up in urban real estate. If it's really expensive to locate in cities, all you're gonna do is the most high value stuff. If people are literally talking about turning downtown San Francisco office space back into manufacturing, which, by the way, we're going to get into on Friday when we talk about the future of cities. We're actually going to talk to people in SF planning who are looking at this data in real time. Um, that'll be a very interesting metric to look at. So, so I just wanted to also point something out too. I think if you if you look into consumer trends, I think that uh, and and I don't know if it's the younger generation or just what people are moving back to, but I kind of feel like consumers are now looking to buy things that are more durable, more lasting, rather than just an impulse purchase. And if that's the case, they are not just going to cheap, but they want to buy something that they can have for a long time um, and more value for that money. So if that's the case, I think it does justify um, actually local manufacturing, because the thing is, it does cost more. But when you have smaller, I don't want to, you know, lack of a better word, cottage industries, um, they are all about uh, creating the value and providing the quality product um, that we're used to seeing from artisans, right, of your past. So maybe mm -hmm. we're just, I, I tend to see that, that um, consumers are kind of moving backwards. Instead of the instant gratification, I want something for the sake of owning something, I actually want something that is quality. And yeah. just like, mm -hmm. you know, eating, right, the food that we're eating now, we, we want the farm fresh to table, we are buying, for example, you know, um, uh, the bread that is made from uh, wheat that is sourced locally from local farmers, right? And not being shipped from two, 3,000 miles away. And we're seeing that tar that trend now as well. Like on that, note, on that note, let's bring in Nadia Hewitt from the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum, who has been ensconced in uh, manufacturing and supply chain issues. And, and we're thrilled to have you because you're, you're, you know, your organization is in touch with manufacturers globally and you're looking at this both in terms of, uh, well, you're looking at this in terms of systems and resilience, which brings you to looking at both the information flows here and how resilient and duplicative the supply chains need to be. So give us a sense for what uh, WEF has been up to and your recent report on this. Stuff. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Peter. Thanks for having me. Delighted to join this conversation. So I'm with the World Economic Forum's office in San Francisco. Uh, we focus on emerging technologies called the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So um, as we look at supply chains and a lot of the issues we've seen that surface during COVID, um, we really come at it from a sort of an emerging technology angle and what digitization and emerging technology can do to um, you know, improve resilience, transparency in supply chains. So Darlene and, and Mickey has uh, touched a lot on manufacturing and sort of the sourcing aspect of supply chains. Uh, I think what, what I can add to that is the overall end-to-end -end supply chain system visibility. Where you source from, uh, whether it's near sourcing or whether you're importing from China or, or other countries, at the end of the day, that end-to-end -end visibility, integrated systems um, still needs to be in place. And I think Hans, uh, who's going to uh, talk later, can really bring as well that domestic perspective. Because I think what we've seen at the World Economic Forum is it's not just a, an international problem. It's also a, an issue of uh, domestic supply chains, right? End-to-end -end visibility. So when you actually look at end-to-end -end visibility uh, and, and supply chain uh, transparency and understanding what's in the pipeline, right? Where is inventory sitting? What's lead times? Um, and knowing what's coming and, and, and uh, for, for partners to really, uh, I would say, look at the same truth that everybody understands what's in the pipeline. Then I would say 
while COVID has surfaced the weaknesses, and of course this has been an unprecedented time, these are not new supply chain issues. This has been um, the challenges we've seen or challenges that's been in place when you talk about supply chain systems already for, for many decades. If you look at previous supply chain disruptions, um, an example could be the E. coli outbreak, you know, when, when you had uh, latest and so, um, it's the same, this, the same problem where you have a breakdown of data. And I think essentially it then becomes a question of data uh, and a willingness of sharing data. It's one thing to have the technical capabilities. So it's a technical feasibility question for sure, but actually more important and the, the more difficult part is governance. The willingness of parties to work together, the willingness of countries to share data, the willingness of, of organizations in the supply chains to share data with each other. Uh, old problem, which again is now really uh, showing <laughs> up in, in COVID, is that you still have companies in the supply chain that is um, not willing to share data. They are artificially creating data silos uh, for different reasons. Uh, one reason being that it's a way of keeping a competitive advantage. They see data as providing them that advantage and sort of the risks associated with sharing data. Um, other reasons could be security, right? Uh, um, especially also when you, you think about international uh, movement of goods, you're talking about customs, data protection, and those uh, data protection is of, of a big concern. Um, you also have personal data handling, you know, GDPR and a lot of these personal data handling. Even in supply chains where you might think there is not a lot of personal data shared, it exists and it's relevant. And all of that creates sort of data barriers and silos. And um, so, yes, technical feasibility, looking at how can we improve our systems? How can emerging technologies help is something that um, at the World Economic Forum, we're working very closely with our partners on. And we've seen a quite a spike in the last couple of months in, um, you know, the tech community, innovators, governments uh, stepping up and, and looking at digitization as a way to um, address some of the economic recovery, uh, long-term system issues uh, that needs to be um, responded to. But at the end of the day, it comes back to, to other governance issues, governance interoperability, um, willingness to share data, uh, agreed legal frameworks um, in place between, between um, countries, companies, uh, data standardization, um, and a number of those issues that really goes yeah, that boils down to, to data. When we, were um, talking, we, oh, just ask, when we were talking the other day, you pointed out that um, in a specific example of this, in, in many cases, the U.S. lags. Uh, that You mentioned that the ports in Europe are more efficient in sharing information in Asia, but here our ports may be more siloed. And I think it's really useful for a U.S. audience to understand what other people do differently and what we might do yeah, uh, I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, uh, if you could elaborate on, on what you've seen here, just a little. And then I think the other part of that, a sort of two-part question is, it seems like you've also written and, and looked deeply into sort of IoT. So how do we sense the Internet of Things related stuff for sensing and understanding what's really happening? The sort of fingerprint of that supply chain, you know, where's it going? Uh, the pieces and parts across the whole flow. And then also the blockchain. And wh why do you think these are interesting technologies? And so it might be interesting to just understand how America is different than maybe what Europe has been doing or, or China. Just a, a taste of that. You don't want to go too far. That's OK. But and then why do you why are you excited maybe about some of these these uh, emerging uh, technologies? Yes. Uh, Peter, you're going to get me in trouble <laughs> for saying that about the US port. So of course, it's um, sharing of data and how digitized ports and terminals and so are it's there's a lot of factors that plays into it it's, it's not you know a, a simple one or two things but at a very high level um, you do see that in Asia and in many European ports their port communities have what they call port community systems in other words they have sort of one system that everybody gets to tap into and share data Whereas you would see um, still very much across Americas, 
um, and including the U.S., that uh, that these poor community systems uh, do not exist to the same degree that you have in Asia and Europe. And again, there's there's many different reasons for that, but I think one of the primary drivers are that in the U.S., it's just people steer away. Uh, regulators do not want to regulate and sort of... <laughs> I would say regulate, I'm going to say force, but but use regulation to to drive communities in ports to share data with each other. Because of course we we the regulation, they, they don't want to overregulate. In Asia, uh, and also to an extent in Europe, you actually will see that regulation or um, related legislation over the years have led to um, sort of uh, port community systems being used. So railways, as cargo comes in, uh, the port can see, the railways can see what's coming in. So all those parties as part of the wider port system has much better visibility. Um, where in the U.S., that's just not the case. Uh, port community systems does not really exist. So the rail operator might not really know what's coming in. Everybody is working in their own sort of siloed system. Um, and yeah, that does absolutely uh, bring additional complexity and, and barriers on the U.S. visibility side when you when you talk about international containers moving into ports. In in terms of sort of emerging technology, uh, the absolutely so um, Internet of Things capturing data, a blockchain technology is sort of that foundational technology, and then the ability of artificial intelligence to to, uh, you know, when you mine data, big data, to be able to uh, get to meaningful um, insights um, is something that absolutely can help with building resilience, transparency, and uh, more trusted data into supply chains. What, um, it's not the silver bullet, it's not, um, it, but it's absolutely something that, that can bring improvement. If you think about distributed ledger technology, or in other words, blockchain technology, um, it's about sharing the same truth. It's the it's distributed. It's peer to peer engagement. So it's sort of the ultimate network technology. So we're sharing a ledger. So what I see is what you see. So that shared version of truth, um, together with other unique features that blockchain technology offers, including uh, the resilient security aspect, the cryptography aspect, um, the immutability, the fact that if you've entered data. Uh, into the system, it's very hard to reverse. It's very difficult to change. So Darlene spoke earlier about uh, the move to to more durable goods, or are, are the consumer is becoming more educated um, on what they procuring. You know, we want organic foods, and we want to to have more proof that something is not you know produced uh, with slave or child labor or. So blockchain technology there then enables that, that transparency given its unique features. Nadia, uh, can you stop for just one sec? I, I want to um, drill down on this. So, so for those people who don't quite understand what blockchain is or what's going on, and I feel like I'm probably in that category, when you say distributed ledger, it's just this notion that if you, if you kept a ledger of everything you put in the bank and everything you took out of the bank, this is sort of sharing that ledger across a lot of places. So if you say, you know, you gave me $100, but I look at my bank, I don't see $100. It's very clear and obvious. So it's kind of like tracking provenance. Like, where did this come from? You know, was it was it built with child labor? Was it done something else? Uh, I noticed Evan Karen is on the live comments and he, he, he runs a fascinating startup called Switch where they use IoT devices to document that someone installed a solar panel on someone's house. And then the solar panel itself has a little thing that proves that it converted a photon to an electron. You know, and it says, I did that. I, I, that's my proof of work. The sun is the central bank. And that creates this circle of trust where you could spoof one thing, but when you start putting it on that blockchain, it's immutable, so it, it begins to see it. And now people can actually see, wow, are those people lying in their spreadsheet about how many fish they're overfishing? If it's a, if it's a dock, well, I can see the boat is lower in the harbor because of the IoT, and I can see the net yeah. is weighing differently. So I can really start understanding from phenomena, not someone's assertion, like I didn't overfish and I'm one of the big five, you know, island fishing groups in the world that that supplies our fresh food. Um, or I didn't claim that I was so solar and, and you know, net zero, but in reality, 
you you kind of really didn't and you were just trying to get those yeah. you know those rebates so so this feels really important but they're not it's not one thing it's not just the blockchain but it's kind of the yeah. iot helps sense the phenomena it's a real thing that happens you yes. were there in that court and then the ai you were saying is all about now you can you can chew over that data you can look at a lot of that data and try to find patterns uh, for optimization or something. I just want to make sure we explain it to the general audience. What's are there examples of companies or organizations that you're seeing that are helping with the with the beginning of maybe some core best practices for things like using blockchain or using IoT in the supply chain? Or is it? Mm. I'm just so kind of curious me, what me, you're let seeing me out first, there. Let me first agree. Agree. So the way you explained it, Mickey, the fact that blockchain uh, doesn't guarantee accuracy, right? Blockchain doesn't guarantee integrity. Just because I type into the system that something's organic doesn't mean that I didn't mm. spray pesticides in reality. Uh. So the the combination of blockchain technology with Internet of Things, you know, with things like RFID tags or sensors mm -hmm. to capture information is very important. Assuming then you capture information accurately when it's on the blockchain, because you're sharing the same version of truth, you're not handing over data from one supply chain party to another where there's blind spots, there might be bad actors who has reasons for, for changing uh, what the data looks like, um, the immutability piece that you it's very difficult to change. So all of that then means like one, when you've used Internet of Things, when you've used um, the emerging technologies available today to 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 capture information having it on blockchain there's an authentication and verification piece to it that increases the likelihood of that data being trusted um, in terms of uh, best practices right now and what we're seeing so maybe just to briefly bring it back sort of to the world we live in today and what the world economic forum is seeing a lot of the questions right now in supply chains is who are the trusted suppliers, right? So with COVID, a lot of companies have had to overnight work with new suppliers, right? And we've seen um, counterfeit mm. masks and fraudulent pharmaceuticals and so forth. So who are trusted suppliers? And that's not a, a question that's unique to COVID. Um, we are increasingly moving to a digitized world. So businesses need to know who they're doing business with digitally. You need to know who's on the other side. So the ability to verify suppliers and the, to do so with blockchain technology, blockchain technology being we are able to tap into each other's shared truths. So you're actually able to share prominent information about suppliers with other organizations. So you're not repeating the same costly time consuming process of verifying these suppliers. If you can tap into distributed ledger technology, there's a huge um, benefit and efficiency gain uh, to be held. And another thing with supply chains where blockchain technology helps is who pays for this? Like, what is the disaster value? Who's at fault in the change, right? So with blockchain, again, where you have a shared ledger and you're able to do claims management, pandemic insurance, um, those questions on who pays, who the trusted partners, where's my cargo, emerging technologies there is, is very useful. I say the last thing just to speak to your best practices, the World Economic Forum last week launched a blockchain deployment toolkit. So for any of you mm. who are looking into blockchain and um, wants to develop a solution, it sort of is an A to Z. It's the gold standard of uh, deploying the technology in a responsible way. So I encourage you to go and look online. It's called Redesigning Trust Blockchain mm. Deployment Toolkit. And and we work with like 200 organizations around the world, experts to kind of, exactly, there it is, to capture their best practices. Um, because again, blockchain is not always the best technology. It has the ability to improve and it has the ability to, to bring more resilience. And But we need to still make sure that these technologies are deployed in a, in a more responsible way. Nadia, earlier, um, you know, we talked about the fact that uh, in the US it's tough to compel people to do things with regulation because we don't like it as much as other places. Dakai in Hong Kong asked the question, uh, what can we do to incent the more sharing of information? Is it consumer demand? Is it ESGs? Is it competitive? What what creates market demand for this to snap into place? 
So we actually at the World Economic Forum are starting a project on data sharing, right? How do you incentivize the sharing of data, especially when there's a common purpose, right? Like healthcare data or things like that, where you can solve critical world challenges by enabling data sharing. Um, essentially, again, I would say it's it's there's the governance level agreeing upon data standardization legal frameworks um, in place, willingness to share data, commercial models, right? You need to achieve um, interoperability at all those levels, commercial models. And then um, it's how do you incentivize people? So the value of data. Uh, now, especially with blockchain, we are able to attach a value to um, to a thing moving, right? That, that value exchange that, that distributed ledger technology enables means that this is going to be something key to figure out. I don't have the answer today, but um, but that's where governments need to work together. You know, maybe starting in a smaller scale, starting with your own regional um, regional data sharing, um, uh, an extra, ter extra uh, territorial uh, uh, legislation to enable data sharing and then finding ways to incentivize people to share data. Um, and then of course, in between all of that, making sure that personal data is protected and that sensitive data is protected. And that actually excites me about blockchain technology because it, 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 it's the, there's a privacy preserving aspect of the technology that can help. You never have to share more data on it than you want to. Um, and you can absolutely protect data with a lot of the new technologies coming out. But yeah, finding ways to incentivize, to pay, um, individuals, organizations for the data is critical. You had this project in the works for a while. Has COVID accelerated people's sense of need for it or implementation? Has this given it kind of a kick to accelerate things? Or are people completely busy doing other stuff? So, yeah. So, in the one hand, uh, people are very busy with just dealing with the immediate crisis, right? But at the same time, um, absolutely, people are already looking to the future and say, let's get this right now. So I started off my conversation saying that none, a lot of the issues we're seeing in supply chains are not new. We knew about many of these issues, right? So co e um, you know, in, in the West Coast, uh, Port of Oakland, Port of Los Angeles, they've had West Coast strikes, uh, 2005, 2000. I remember going to the movies in 2000 and. 12, right, and get to the movie and the cinema's closed because the cinema seats haven't been delivered because vessels have been sitting for weeks outside of the Port of Los Angeles because there was union union rate negotiations, right? So during those times, you will see the organization stepping up and, uh, you know, doing proof of concepts to understand how can technology improve, how can we share data better. It's happening during the times, but then stuff starts going okay again and people forget. What we've seen this time, organizations are taking those proof of concepts off the shelf, they're dusting it off, and there's real momentum behind, um, real momentum and real urgency, I would say, around the seriousness of solving these issues. So we do believe that different from before, where you know people sort of go back to the, the time before, now it's necessary to change. Um, and I think... Yeah, we shouldn't let the good crisis go to waste here. Um, mm. Let's. Uh, we're going to bring in Hans Galad right now. Uh, who uh, Hans? Are you with us here? I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Excellent. Speaking of just in time, Hans's Perfect. power went out. You've come back on your phone, so this is uh, talk about resilience. We've learned a lot about internet resilience yes. here. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we've just been talking about um, the fact that this. Uh, COVID shock has kind of exposed uh, weaknesses or lack of resilience in supply chain. You recently started a company that's focused on distribution in the US. You focused on trucking and what looks like a deeply established portion of our transportation economy, but you're finding enormous inefficiencies, especially because you have lots of trucking companies that are small, don't have shared information systems. And if all of a sudden the patterns change one day, a particular trucker works with a particular supplier and that supplier, everything changes, that it's a system that's not adapted. So uh, give us a sense for uh, kind of what you've learned in your path here, uh, the inefficiencies that we see and kind of how we're building for tomorrow. 
Yeah, this is exciting, Hans, just because of the stuff you shared with me, I kind of just assume that trucking stuff just works, you know, and I actually have a, a, a stepbrother who's a who's a trucker, over the road trucker in the United States, and it's a hard life. And I keep wondering, like, you know, I've had small conversations with him. It's just, it's not easy out there. But I also just see that trucking works. And then I wonder, is it working right now? And what's happening? And when you when you shared a little bit about what you've been doing and what you find out there, just going out and actually listening, riding with truckers, uh, it's quite shocking. Can you can you just jump in on this? I, I think it's amazing. If Hans is there. Um. This this, the, the, this is the, this we, is the yeah uh, we may the supply have, chain of packets apparently between our trucks oh, and you're back. back I'm back yeah uh, my my electricity came back so of course the, the router came back and uh, information problems <laughs> but yeah, make, yeah. I, I heard I heard what you said and Peter of course mm. too um, so I think the the way we define our business is we we are a smart smart data business um, and I think what what that means for us that a we we play in an area where information and data is not uh, efficiently and effectively uh, shared um, which is very much uh, what um, Nadia mentioned on informational silos being established so in all parts of the value chain we only have one particular link and that's the the logistics piece but it's very clear to us that um, information is is very inefficiently shared um, and what what Peter mentioned is is very true. So um, what the pandemic out of COVID nineteen has has really highlighted for us is um, that the um, trucking businesses, which by and large are small companies, ninety seven percent of the trucking company in the U.S. have fewer than twenty trucks. Um, Wait, say that not, say that statistic again, Hans. I just want to make sure I get that right. 97% of the trucking companies in the U.S. have fewer than 20 trucks. So these are small wow, okay. um, family uh, business. In most cases, a lot of them are run by um, first or second generation immigrants. Um, so it's a very, a very uh, actually very interesting um, um, mix of, of, of companies. Now, um, there are 600,000 of them in the U.S., <laughs> 600,000 trucking companies. Um, in the 19, just for example, in the 1980s, there were only 20,000 trucking companies in, in, in the U.S. So through deregulation, what's happened is um, that um, um, price barriers, licensing barriers have been dropped. And as a result of that, there has been an influx of small uh, trucking companies who all are marginally profitable in most cases. And, and, and as a result of that, as out of the competitive forces, um, there's actually a, a real market failure uh, when you look at information flows and in two ways. A, um, the trucking companies um, don't have access to the you know, full set of information that's available in the market, but also B, they don't have the resources um, and um, you know, funding resources, financial resources, but often also sometimes just not the cognitive resources to build in uh, smart decision tools. Um, and that's uh, where we come in at Holistic. So, so we essentially aggregate information from across the logistics market. Um, we play in the full truckload logistics market only. We aggregate it uh, and we combine it and, 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 and provide it to trucking companies in a way that makes operational sense to them. So, so specifically what we do is we, we, we route trucks um based on what is most efficient for them uh from a profit perspective so we're solving for for profit per truck per day it seems very simple and seems very straightforward but it only is only uh really achievable if you incorporate a lot of data and you make decisions um without without biases so well you said going uh, back Hans, to just for a second i want to i want to get really tangible with this so you said uh 97 percent of the trucking companies have fewer than 20 trucks, 600,000 companies in the US, marginally profitable, small small mom and pop things. So what's what's the failure mode for them? Like how are they on the cliff between profitable and not profitable and what are you doing to kind of make that better, mm. like to, to close that loop? Yes, so um, so what, what we do is um, we create uh, informational efficiencies um, in, in their operations, aggregating market data 
and repackaging the actual flow of business to them in a way that they can operate more profitably. Um, and uh, the reason why, why why informational asymmetries in in the market exist, um, you know, there's some very organic reasons. There, there's geography, the fact that a trucking company is not located where necessarily their their customer is located. Um, but there's also industry structure reasons for it, uh, and that can be the fact that the uh, logistic service providers, so the, um, these are intermediaries, these are brokers, um, these, this particular link in the value chain is actually uh, reasonably concentrated. And, and that's where we see informational silos where data doesn't get shared um, across silos. And as a result of that, trucking companies do not have access to a comp comprehensive um, view of, 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 of the sea of data that's out there and opportunities for them. And secondly, because they're so strapped, they don't, they don't have the capabilities to optimize, um, for their own, for their own sake. So it's almost like, uh, they, I mean, I'm trying to think of how do, how does a trucker lose money? How does a trucking company lose money? Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing it's, you know, they end up getting a, a contract for something and then they, they're deadhead on the way back. They, they, they don't have any. Uh, stuff to put in the back of the truck. So if you're not, it's uptime for the truck. What I, I would imagine is one metric. I, I would imagine another thing maybe we're seeing right now, and if maybe you could elaborate on this, what are you seeing in terms of people who had one major like uh, bread and butter customer who disappears? Or I, I guess that's right. happening, right? Because there are just so many small exactly. businesses. Yeah. What's happening with that? So let, let, let me let me address both examples. The first, ex the la second example is we have one particular customer who's been serving a uh, automotive plant in uh, San Antonio for for years. Um, he has twenty trucks, um, and um, he has you know ninety percent of his business was dependent on this particular uh, shipper. Um, as a result of the closures uh, during COVID-19, his business basically suddenly had to move out of what we talk about as contract freight into, into the spot market for freight. Now, organizationally, he was not set up to, to operate a, uh, a freight in the spot market, which means essentially every day he has to go to the marketplace and source loads to keep his truck, trucks busy and running. So um, we came in and, and we were working with him to, to build that interface, the real-time interface between his organization and the marketplace to, to A, feed him aggregated market data, but secondly, also to route his trucks in a way that they could route it to the most profitable um, markets uh, at a given point in time. So this also this addresses your question on, on deadheading, how a typical trucker would operate. So um, since we, we, what we use is we use uh, artificial intelligence tools. We also use um, other um, deterministic methodologies to route the trucks. Um, but we solve for, we solve, we don't solve for a full truck, frankly. We solve for profit per truck per day. And one of the interesting phenomena we find is that some of the heuristics that trucking companies apply seem to make a lot of sense. So, um, you know, deadheading, reducing empty miles seems to be very, very intuitive to, to reduce. What we find, though, is when we route the truck, sometimes we actually achieve, we, we, we incur slightly higher rates of deadheading because the human brain is actually not very good at deciding when it makes sense to drive empty, when it doesn't make sense to drive empty. So we strike that balance uh, really well. We can say it actually makes sense for you to drive 200 miles empty because you're driving into a market that's particularly lucrative for you. So, so mm. these, and this is a very concrete example of how in, information processing capabilities are limited, A, by the amount of data that's available to a trucking company, and B, their ability to make uh, de-biased decisions um, that a human brain, frankly, cannot do with, with bounded rationality. Hans, I wanted to, um, in addition to your, what you're doing now, you spent a lot of time in China. And, uh, uh, you know, as we look at this U.S.-China issue of trade, I'd love to bring Darlene and, and, and Nadia back in right now. Um, I'm, I'm lo I'd love to get um, your perspective, both as a Global SF board member and as an entrepreneur who's operated over there on, you know, on some of these issues of how does California as a state or almost, you know, our economy here as a city state, um, collaborate internationally, you know, at a time when, you know, 
what we're trying to do economically may be slightly at odds with national government, and yet we're at a moment of federalism. Because it's because you know one of the themes here is um, increasingly we want to incent, for example, local ports to operate or local actors to operate. And so this all this, this, our policies and national policies to run run up against each other. But in a way, we're all you know San Franciscoists type here promoting our interests. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And then. Um, and, and then, you know, Nadia, maybe you're seeing some of this around the world as well. You there, Hans? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Good. So what I think we've seen um, is mm. a, a rebalancing. And I think Darlene has described that very um, astutely um, um, in, in the way uh, local manufacturing is being promoted um, and, and valuable. Uh, specifically, when it become, comes to you know fast response time, I think that's that's kind of where I see the three um, the three um, participants in this in, in, in the session today really uh, come together. And it is if you need a highly responsive supply chain, there's of course you require um, information flows that are efficient, but you also require operations that sometimes are onshore because there is a geographical distance between China and the US um, that, that allows for, for very, very responsive um, manufacturing or, or production, right? Um, so I think that's that's what Darlene has mentioned. And I think that that's consistent in what, what we've seen. I think California, obviously, um, with its focus on, a you know, very strong focus on Asia, if you look at um, you know the port volumes. How much? How much of the trade actually, for instance, in Oakland comes from Asia? It's it, it's 80, 90 percent probably. It's my guess is coming actually from Asia. So there's a there's a huge interconnectedness um, of the uh, California economy with 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 Asia, um, and it will um, very likely continue to exist and and mutually benefit both economies. But yet there's a rebalancing in time um, happening that. That that is beneficial, um, and if I think we're, if we're putting in, also, this is, if we're putting in resilience and uh, redundance in the system, and to the point that Darling was making more durability, do things just get a whole lot more expensive? Because when we when we move away from optimizing for the lowest cost and just in time, and we put in resilience, it seems like uh, uh, the cost side has to change. I guess it depends if you want to actually eat or not, you know, or something. I just heard yep. half of the Wendy's in the country are out of meat, um, yep. you know, with the slogan, where's the beef? That's a little scary. I, you know, I think I think this is a humans and Hans mentioned this um, bounded rationality. Herb Simon's framing on the that humans actually don't have capacity to make uh, complex decisions beyond a certain level. And we need to actually help with that. Um, Mm -hmm. Making decisions that have to do with long-term survival of the species is kind of tricky uh, for people, and so they kind of go for you know cheapest, but cheap for for what purpose? And I, I think that that's a part of this question. Nadia or, or Darlene, what are you well, saying I, out I, there in this regard, or how? Yeah. yeah, so I, I think yeah. with this kind of question. It is always very tricky to just refer to supply chains as one thing, you know, and I, I, I always mm. caution that's the difficult, uh, difficult thing about reading media because you just everything about supply uh, chains you're reading in media. Yeah. They just um, this is where you need to get granular and you need to look at the nuances because a footwear supply chain is very different from a commodity market It's very different from raw materials from Africa It's very different from. There's absolutely um, still a need for for global for global sourcing, um, especially when you look at you know infrastructure, uh, raw materials, etc. And also a lot of the um, uh, international supply chains, you know, importers in San Francisco they've invested money in factories and in, in setting up. Um, I was living in China for a few years, working in supply chains there during the TPP, when, when everybody thought the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement was going to go through. So we were seeing a lot of retailers and importers moving from China to Vietnam, Myanmar. And I mean, it took, it took months, if not years, and a lot of costs to, to move a lot of the, the investments they've done overseas. So this is not something that can just happen overnight. And I think that's... When you, when you want to have that type of discussion and say what is the implication for California and how do we work with China, you really need to go into the details of what commodities, what mm. what type of goods are we talking about here, and the the, the details are important. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing is that the fact of the matter is California has always been open for business. And I think that we were restricted by two things. One, especially in the time of COVID, it's like, are any shipments actually taking place, right? Uh, China has closed their ports and they had stopped imports as well as exports and planes. They were not letting planes, you know, take off, right? Um, as, as well, the U.S., we were not letting planes land because of COVID. Uh, in addition to that, um, you know, we're, we're looking at, and now I lost my train of thought, um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's just a matter of our, our shipments being allowed. Uh, so I think that has been limiting. But the thing is, this, uh, sorry, the second thing that limits our ability to trade, um, uh, for lack of a better word or, or definition, is that from a federal level, we are not, you know, they will not let us trade, for example, with China and saying we don't want and we're going to impose tariffs. And even though California said, hey, you know, we will take and buy and trade and, you know, uh, continue to do business. Um, in many ways, we are not an independent, you know, state. Um, we wish we were our own, country, you know, uh, uh, country state or city state. Uh, and I'm sure so many people have talked about it. You know, our governor has talked about it. But the fact of the matter is we're still part of the union and we are restricted uh, because of that in terms of open trade, so to speak. I'm wondering, you know, the, a theme across today is that if we want things to work better and have less shocks, we need sharing and we need, right, we, we, we need a systems approach to all of this. And there is kind of across the world this kind of protectionist or, or nationalist air. And yet part of what we're hearing is, um, you know, whether you have a low, you, you'll never have a wholly local thing. It may be distributed. So I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, how do we either raise awareness or kind of get our fellow citizens to understand that it's actually greater sharing that leads to more resilience that then might be better for a local supply chains in general? Because there, there's an argument to be made here that probably has to be made more broadly to more constituencies or else everybody just gets accused of being a globalist or something. Yeah, I think the challenging thing, Peter, um, is not only is it just sharing, but I think there's a, uh, as, as you rightly, rightfully have pointed out, is um, there is a cost to resilience, um, mm. either through redundancy in the system or simply because flexibility is costly. Right? We've seen it with this particular trucking company that traded off flexibility for a contract with Toyota. Uh, mm -hmm. and put all their eggs in a basket. Uh, had they not done that, they may have had a less optimally or less optimized operation for a while, but since the market suddenly changed, they 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 lost the benefit, you know, they, they suddenly suffered from the lack of flexibility. So so that trade-off in in you know between stability and flexibility and how to build redundancy in the system is all involves cost. And I think that the, the question is also who's willing to, to to shoulder that cost, um, who's willing to 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 govern that that cost of uh -huh. the system, and I think that really requires a shared system thinking approach, and and a it's a governance question ultimately that will need to be resolved uh, amongst all the participants in in in, in the ecosystem. You this know, kind of makes me think of the the you know the notion of um, generative design is that you have multi dimensions and you have different stakeholders. And each person weighs in on their problem framing and what they care about, what their reward mechanisms are. And then, you know, the machine learning systems go out and spawn 10,000 interns that explore the possibility space because humans are not so great at this. Um, it, but I really, uh, it feels like, you know, I, I don't think there's generative design for the global supply chain. And when we say global supply chain, I think it's fascinating uh, to go back to what Nadia said, which is beware generalization in the media. You know, so so much of this, there's so many nuances hidden behind the layers and layers and layers of complexity here. And uh, I almost wish I had a, a, a sort of supply chain fact checker or a, something that I could like send to my family when they when they freak out about something or when they see something, um, not in a bad way or good way, just because I want to be able to go, okay, here's the reality. And these are real people's lives and real people profit margins at stake and it's complicated. And, and sort of enlightened nationalism doesn't turn out to be a bad, bad thing sometimes, but understanding that we are in one earth, uh, you know, is also the set of trade-offs. And um, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't envy anybody who's in the supply chain business right now in terms of dealing with these things. I think it's very complex 
and we have to we have to give people a lot of uh, uh, faith that they that they are the experts on this. But I'm excited and and sort of pleased to hear what Nadia is talking about in terms of redesigning the blockchain, redesigning trust, and, and helping kind of historic organizations in the supply chain think again about what they might do with the commoditization of IoT, with the with the 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 ability to have massively distributed but trusted uh, data. Um, there there are some interesting signals here, um, but it ultimately kind of boils down to humans, and that's where we get. Nadi, a lot of as, if pe as people have talked about blockchain and supply chain in in the you know the past several months, a lot of it has, as you pointed out, has had to do with understanding the provenance of seafood or is is are the pharmaceuticals true or not, um, you know, which really has to do with trust and quality. Going forward, what what are the kind of sets of problems that this can solve? And I'm wondering as we wrap up, if we all might, you know. We're going to go through this really interesting period of, I guess, a fair amount of unemployment, a recession, and then we're going to come out the other side with new systems in place. So maybe if we could think ahead uh, 18 months or a couple of years, what 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 we would expect to see different and more resilient and in place, and maybe not even some specifics of kind of like what, what you or your membership are envisioning where we'll be once we make investment after this. Yes, I think the the shift to authentication and verification of data. I mean, right now trust is at an all all time low, so organizations need to ad address the trust question. Consumers, the younger consumer, investors, employees, um, are keeping their are keeping uh, companies to higher standards. They want to know what they are buying. They're making more educated decisions. They care about environment. So um, paying a premium for goods that um, that they trust, for brands that they trust. So I think the um, blockchain can help and improve. Again, not the silver bullet. It still has many barriers uh, to, to get to where we can really make it a scalable system. But where those technologies can help with, with trusted data and, and transparency and traceability, it's uh, very important. Um, that that story the story that a good tells it helps with efficiency but um yeah i think it all comes back to trust and that redesigning trust in a way uh, i think summarizes it really well um the companies who can do that well i think will succeed in, in the future and then of course for us um there's today a big reliance on centralized systems you know huge uh, companies who's owning more and more and more you know owning data, owning transactions. So the more we can move to, to more distributed systems, the more we can level the playing field for everybody and make sure that everybody along the supply chain can capture value and that we um, reallocate value as we create extra, extra, yeah, but it's very important. How would we characterize where we're headed, right? There's a people, there's been globalization and there's a big reaction to globalization uh, either because of, of what it does to, to labor or what it does to cost here. Is this globalization, but with redundance and resilience? I mean, it's, we're not, is it like lots of hyper-local things, but also with then components that come internationally? How would we describe the thing that isn't globalization, but where we're headed? Well, the thing is that there's one thing, I think there's one factor that we also have to take into consideration, and it is that we're looking at a global economy, but the thing is that every single country is different, right? Um, in China, for example, we all know it's top down, you know, it, it's centralized uh, planning, management, and then in the US, it's bottom up, it's all entrepreneurialism, it's all private sector, and then the government jumps in to try to legislate. I think that, you know, understanding how the different countries work, um, how do we, let's start with the US, for example, I think that there's got to be more communication between the government as together with the private sector, so that we can start to identify where are the pain points, and be able to create a more integrated system that actually talks to each other so that we can achieve what Nadia has actually brought up, you know, a more informed, more distributed system instead of more centralized, because currently, as we all are starting to see, it is not working. Yeah, I, I wanted to um, also, you know, point towards there is there's certainly a uh, socioeconomic or so, so 
uh, social equity dimension to this that we particularly in our case we've seen that the the small and medium-sized businesses the highly fragmented part of the marketplace and i'm, I'm pretty sure in in global food supply chains, um, that may be similar, right? When you go to um, um, manufacturers of certain food food items, where where those um, are not necessarily enabled by the value chain dynamics, because they are really at the receiving end of the value chain, whereas a lot of uh, bargaining power is held by the large larger players. Um, and as a result of that, they're also not necessarily technologically enabled as much as the big ones. And I think one of the big questions that I continue to raise, and that's what we are trying to do in what, what we do at Holistic, is how do you actually technologically enable um, the, the smaller players, uh, the fragmented parts of the value chain, and how do you uh, make sure that, as Nadia said, that they also can start capturing value uh, more fairly uh, and, and and have a chance to to grow economically and, and and succeed economically because currently I think that's a big challenge that we see in the U.S. The average small trucking company may not have the funds or the bandwidth to spend on technology and and it may be existential for them. Hey, and I got another question for you, Hans. So when we when we talk about trucking, one of the first things that comes to mind is automation. You're optimizing for small trucking companies, many of which are owned by drivers, mm. uh, but on everybody's mind is is self-driving trucks. So how much, how much is this just the front end of even more disruption that we'll see coming in pretty quickly? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, so our view is that um, autonomy will come, but it will come over a very long period of time and you know, through the typical phases that it will come at. Um, we believe that human drivers, um, even if it's just a safety driver, will continue to exist. Um, now there's technology, there's platooning, et cetera, that increases, de decreases labor intensity. Yet at the same time, you also see um, a decreasing interest in, in, um, in trucking jobs um, in the industry. So um, that's, that's a challenge that somehow counterweighs um, you know, the, um, the threat of um, automation, I think it will be it will be another couple of decades until it can be applied um, 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 across the country in all contexts. Um, um, but um, at the at the moment, it's not going to affect us. At least not. It doesn't affect us, and it doesn't affect um, the truck economies we work today. But ultimately, to your question, I think one of the questions that you have in the back of your mind is how do you how how important ultimately will become capital. Um, in in the future, um, where um, you know, the acquisition of a, a autonomous truck or an autonomous trucking fleet uh, will suddenly create uh, tremendous cost efficiency, you know, right about twenty or thirty percent of your operating cost by just owning an autonomous truck versus a humanly driven truck. And then and then I think that's even more a question of of social equity and. And probably what we see the extreme fragmentation that we have now will be will be um, you know done with, and we'll see much more consolidation in the sector. Yeah, and I think just to add the the China perspective here, Hans, was it what you were saying? Twenty trucks in the U.S. per per trucking company, or something like that. So in China, this number is a couple years old, but in China, the average number of trucks per trucking company is two trucks. So when you talk yes. about social equity, <laughs> if you talk about small and medium enterprises, imagine they're trucking, you know, business and and a company that really make a living off two trucks um, and the importance of, of uh, bringing all of those people along and bringing them into supply chain systems, you know, uh, building systems where they oh, can yeah. participate because <laughs> it's very fragmented. Very. very I would say this, though, you know, I mean, one of the things I saw with construction equipment in China when I worked over there on a major design initiative around IOT for the construction industry, what I saw was that the banks and the educational platforms for actually teaching somebody to move an excavator and use it would have very amazingly good loans uh, for, for an excavator because they were trying to build a whole like, you know, subway or a, a city. Um, and a person would own two or three $250,000 equivalent excavators. Um, and the bank would actually put IOT devices on the trucks to shut them down or to shut down just the arm if they didn't pay their bills. But a big uh, effort that I saw there was actually upskilling. 
In other words, if I can get a lot more people doing construction work, then it's a little bit better, at least in building an economy, than maybe the factory jobs that are getting replaced by robots. And I saw the same thing from Didi Shuxang, where they were talking about we're actually not accelerating towards autonomous because we're actually trying to actually absorb a lot of the, the automation that's happening in factories and teach people how to be basically customer service oriented with the stand, they're sort of the, uh, they may have even bought Uber of China. Uh, they're, the, they're the sort of, you know, automation team for, for, for helping all that um, because they were investing in large scale, you know, future looking uh, growth of a middle class. And so, you know, we, we have very different reward mechanisms, I think, for these. That, you know, on the, on the surface, they look, wow, two trucks versus 20. But there's probably a, an entirely different layer, as you said, Nadia. That these things are so subtle in terms of what happens behind the scenes. I mean, this conversation highlights the, you know, on the one hand, all of these things help capital be more efficient because we're making things more efficient. On the other hand, uh, you, we haven't even got into the fact that this that the COVID has accelerated the employment shock issue. And Nadia, the, the you know, your membership must, on the one hand, want to improve its efficiency. And on the other hand, they see all these political pressures to support labor and employees. And that has to create, I don't know, you know, two, two parts of the brain fighting each other. This must be a big discussion that's going on in how you resolve all these issues. Yes. And I think the way we see it is it's just so important for public and private sector to keep speaking to each other. So I think that's also why the World Economic Forum during these times plays such an important role in providing a safe space and convening um, public and private sector. And I think private sector is more and more going to have to lean into helping public sector. We can't rely on regulation yeah. to fix everything. The world's moving too fast. Um, I mm. think private sectors, there's a big role on them to to lean in for, uh, and, and sort of become more agile and help the world be more agile. And, you know, you as we wrap up today, You've been talking to me a little bit about how the World Economic Forum innovation community has responded in the last month. I mean, just as this program is all about connecting up communities and looking at innovation, when we first started talking, you have a bunch of young innovators that you've connected up. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the burst of innovation you're seeing just in the last couple of months. Yeah. So the World Economic Forum has um, a COVID action platform where we have official partners and um, a, many projects that addresses immediate COVID issues and also more long-term issues. Um, it's also available. There's really cool stuff to check out for uh, for anybody at the general public, COVID action platform. But then the World Economic Forum has this global shapers community. So it's people and individuals under 30 who's shaping the world, you know, doing um, uh, good stuff in, in their local and regional communities. And the global shapers globally um, over the last three weeks, as an example, have stepped up and a dozen or more of these hubs across the world have collaborated around um, technology sprints, innovation, uh, coming up with ideas together, uh, you know, hour by hour virtual workshops to help each other um, and bring knowledge and exchange based practices to sort of find innovative uh, solutions to, to challenges. So, you know, seeing this, you know, under 30 under fittings, you know, the, the hub of Johannesburg together with the Beijing hub together with the San Francisco hub. In fact, it was led by the Global Shaper San Francisco hub. So, so good, good kudos to them. But yeah, really seeing these communities stepping up um, at all levels of the organization, at all uh, age, diversity, etc., to help solve immediate but also more long-term um, issues that we need to address as a result of COVID. You know, one of the, I think, hopeful things that we may be seeing earlier in one of our episodes, we had uh, Kevin Kelly on. We were talking about cool tools and we were talking about uh, tools that increase collaboration. For example, even the whiteboard that uh, Mickey has, the Miro whiteboard here is a collaboration tool. And one of the things that Kevin talked about is uh, what we need is, is just more out of the global hive mind that at a time when we have so many problems, you actually want global collaboration and you know lots of minds and students and people working on things. And what does that look like? And it just strikes me that the burst of innovation we've seen in the last few weeks may be a harbinger of what happens if we all connect up this cognitive capacity that we have. And we also have a really interesting opportunity coming up in the next year because a lot of students won't be going back to school perhaps for the rest of 2020. 
that's a lot of smart people thinking about the future with a stake in it that we might be able to connect up and get working in collaboration with the many innovation communities that we see. So that, that strikes me. I don't know if you're seeing that, Nadia, but it just strikes me that this is a, a great time for kind of an all hands on deck collaborating in the future. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we need to jointly, uh, you know, we need to catalyze global communities collaboration and, and share best practices to address these challenges. And I mean, going back to our earlier conversation on data, sharing data to solve the world's critical issues, right? Um, a lot of the if countries can share data with each other and enable, we can all uh, solve many of our critical issues much faster and more effectively together, for sure. Now, Darlene, San Francisco's brand these days is about innovation. And we, you know, we, your whole organization is about continuing to promote that. And it strikes me that as an innovation leader, we, we, we now have this responsibility to be a help, a leader in connecting things up. I mean, your organization and Nadia's are about connecting things up. And I'm, I'm imagining that over the next year or so, as we come out of this, uh, if the private sector has a big responsibility to help lead, our innovation center in San Francisco has an especially big one. And that ought to be the topic of a lot of what we all want to be working on in, in the coming months, but doing it in an even more open, transparent, bigger way. Absolutely. I mean, we're already starting to see trends, uh, for example, because it's, it's been the COVID uh, period, uh, we're starting to see a lot more investment in biotech, for example. And we're also starting to look at, you know, the future of workforce. Uh, clearly, you know, um, uh, working from home, people are starting to get used to it. It's kind of a new normal. Uh, we've also learning that a lot of companies have started to lay off people, uh, you know, and including Uber, including Airbnb. And what does that mean? Does that mean that tech is not working anymore? Or, you know, is the economy changing and we're pivoting into new areas and different areas? So looking at the future of workforce, I think is definitely something that we're looking at. Um, and, and now that uh, we're starting to see where the trends are, what can we do as an as an agency, as an organization that will help not just San Francisco, but the rest of the Bay Area? How do we help these uh, cities then, you know, realize are we going to have to start change, uh, start changing the way that, you know, we set legislation uh, that we actually, you know, work with the private sector? Um, a lot of things we have to talk about and we're, we're going to and we anticipate um, that, you know, not only are we looking at ourselves in the bubble because we're not anymore. Uh, but the thing is that how do we also start working, uh, for example, even with China, because as you all know, China's been talking about, you know, one belt, one road initiative. Uh, but it also, they also started looking at the Greater Bay Area Initiative and how do we at San Francisco and Bay Area plug into that and make that a more collaborative effort instead of saying it only benefits you, it only benefits me, but look at it as a collaboration and maybe, you know, implement, you know, items or different areas that we talked about today and plug into that and again, bring the private sector into it and make sure everybody's sharing information and being able to you know, create a new normal you know, coming out of COVID. Yes. And by the way, this is a, a very good setup for Friday show. By the way, to remind everybody, you, you're watching Quarantine, and I want to thank all of you guys for, for, for joining us today. Uh, but Darlene, that's a great setup that Fridays, we're going to get into our show, which is called The Future of Cities is Everything revisited because uh uh you know in this in this crisis suddenly people have found that working at home is pleasant and maybe we don't need all the downtown office buildings as much uh, we have kind of cleared out so much of small business and the question is how does that come back and what's the the cost basis of that san francisco's wrestling with you know whether the future of restaurants uh and so from a city plan, you know, so much of city planning is designed on creating uh, density and excitement uh, in downtown areas. And yet we're saying to people, well, maybe you should be less dense. It's safer to do so. So much of the orthodoxy of what city planners have been aiming at is suddenly up for questions. But this might also be a wonderful moment for America's smaller cities because uh, a lot of people have gone home in all of this. And, and they've realized, uh, you know, maybe I can work from the town I grew up in. And a lot of companies are realizing there's a cost difference there. I don't think that there's a system out there that has as much change of foot or as much opportunities as what's happening with our cities. Uh, just because so many of the variables are changing and uh, 
Uh, and so there's so many questions to be answered. So on Friday, we're going to have Kent Larson, who runs the City Sciences Lab at MIT. And Kent's going to take us through a lot of what uh, they're thinking. Also joining us is Jose Campos, um, who's one of the top city redevelopment planners in San Francisco. Jose led the efforts that led to the uh, Trans Bay Center and the Salesforce building. Probably the greatest statement of transit-oriented development in our history in San Francisco right at a time when like, well, maybe people don't need to take BART to the downtown as much, or maybe things will change. So how do we resolve all of that? And what does planning look like? How do we even set that up? And also joining us from Boston is Nigel Jacobs, who was the founder of the new urban mechanics lab in, in, in Boston, which is really the innovation uh, hub for Boston. So we're gonna get into that uh, next time on Friday, which will really be the first of several of the shows that we wanna do on the future of cities, which of course is also a foil for the future of work, the future of restaurants, the future of food logistics. And uh, you, you know, how do we make convivial places that we wanna be in at the same time that maybe we don't wanna be as close? So this, this is gonna be really fascinating stuff. So I wanna thank uh, all of you uh, today. Uh, the, 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 this discussion on, on supply chain and systems highlights the degree to which this is a global systems issue. And so, Darlene, we're going to be back in touch. And Nadia, so much more that we can do with the World Economics Forum. And Hans, I think the internet's gone out, but thank you again. <laughs> Nick, let me throw it over to you for for for. Thanks, everybody. Thoughts. Thank well, you. you know, uh, uh, yeah, I just I loved it. I don't have anything else to add to it. Um, I'm looking forward to Friday because cities are are where things actually happen in many cases, whether it's a small town or city or whatever. We do things in physical places, and they're not they're not going to go away. They might just look very different in the future. So I'm super excited to see how we, how we understand the street corner and, and, and how we build from that. Thanks everybody. We'll be posting to the site. So if you go to quarantine, we're at quarantine dot today. And if you go over there, uh, we've already posted a Friday show, but we're also going to post uh, the reading list. All of us who are working on it have been looking at a whole stream of articles about where are people's preferences to live, what happens to placemaking? And and um, uh, the Placemaking Journal, one of the top publications in urbanism, republished a whole bunch of articles about cities and pandemics in their history. So it's almost like a syllabus that informs us on where we might be going. And then I think you'll see in future shows that we do, we wanna get the audience involved and start looking at how do you do broad scenario planning with a global public and a global audience to start considering some of these issues because it's that hive mind that we wanna put to work. You may have noticed that over the last two months, I think I may have said this before, there's been less talk about artificial intelligence in the sense that we suddenly have problems today that really require humans. And uh, uh, and how we rebuild out of this is probably the greatest problem of all, and that's what we hope to do more of. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back on Friday. You can find more about us at quarantine.today. Thank you for tuning in to Quarantine. It's now 5.28. Pacific Quarantine. We'll see you in a couple of days. Let's get close, but not so close. Quarantine. You can share from a distance. Quarantine. You know we want to see each other. You'll have to stay in your corner. Down space while we talk. Quarantine.